My name is Hugh Burroughs. It's my pleasure to introduce to you a series of interviews we're calling Conversations with Don Anderson. Mr. Anderson is a captain of industry, an artist, a patron of the art, a father, all around good fellow. Sit back and enjoy these conversations with Don Anderson done in the spring of 2009. Well, I was born in Chicago, Illinois in April 1919. And my parents are, are both uh, from Sweden. Uh, my father came here as a child, three years old. My mother's uh, parents had uh, come here a few years before, and she was born in Chicago. And Chicago had a, a large uh, group of uh, immigrants from S Sweden, especially in the uh, uh, south, the province of Småland, and uh, a great number of them settled in Chicago. So as a child, I uh, was exposed to a lot of Swedish people. I never spoke Swedish or cared to her, but uh, that was... Uh, uh, my first uh, experience with uh, Sweden. Yeah. Uh, how old were your parents when you were born? Uh, well, my father was probably, uh, well, both in their late 20s, yeah. Right. Okay. And where are you in the birth order of children? Uh, I have two older brothers and a younger sister. We're all two years apart. I'm the third one. And what did your father do in Chicago? Well, he, uh, at 10 years old, he started speaking uh, or teaching Swedish people English. And uh, he was evidently pretty good at that because, uh, and made some income that way. But uh, when he was 13 years old, he went to work as a bellhop in the First National Bank of Chicago. And uh, he retired from that bank 75 years <laughs> later. And uh, the normal retirement age is 65, but he had actually 75 years of service when he retired and then continued to uh, keep an office in the bank, and he died at 96. <laughs> oh, so he rose in, in the bank? Is that, that was his life? Yes, right. He just came up through the ranks and was executive vice president when he retired. And your mother uh, raised the four children? Right, yeah, yeah. And so you are you downtown Chicago? Where are you? Uh, no, on the south side in Hyde Park, right... Uh, next to the University of Chicago. Um, describe your home when you were growing up. What, do, what did it feel like? Well, we lived in a large apartment a block and a half from the university campus. And uh, it was a, a wonderful neighborhood because a lot of the, uh, my friends were from the uh, University of Chicago Laboratory School. I went through there in elementary school and high school. And uh, we are all just kind of a neighborhood there. And many of the uh, uh, kids in the school were um, children of university professors. I suppose maybe a fourth or more of the enrollment was uh, uh, university kids. And Tell us uh, some of your earliest memories. Well, I, my earliest memories are hard to find. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. But, uh, well, uh, that, that's uh, hard to say. I can remember my school years uh, much easier. Okay, well tell us about your school years. Well, I started at, uh, in the uh, first grade in the elementary school there. And it was one of the 
uh, this school, one of those big university Gothic buildings. And uh, over the years, uh, uh, had the same uh, classmates all the way through high school. And uh, I don't keep track of many of them. I do know that uh, John Stevens, my uh, neighborhood friend and uh, classmate, is now a, a Supreme Court uh, a justice. So I do <laughs> keep up with him when I see him on the television. But I don't have any real connection with any of them. Well, uh, what were some of your interests in the laboratory grade school? Well. Uh, I was not a good student, you know. I just uh, didn't uh, apply myself well. It was a chance for a wonderful education, which I got some of, but uh, not all of, I'm sure. But, uh, well, example is uh, the laboratory schools and the university developed the IQ exam. And we were uh, when they'd have a new version, they'd give it to us. So we took uh, IQ exams about every six months. And I remember, uh, one, I think it was when I was in high school, my advisor, Mr. Smith, called me in and uh, very seriously and said you know, that I had my uh, IQ was going down, <laughs> and uh, it was serious, and, and, I, and I just said, well, I don't know what to do about it. <laughs> but, well, so inevitably you had to graduate from high school. What did you do about it then? What, what was next? Chicago was a very uh, wild place then. There, you know, there's, Three big things, or four maybe, were the gangsters. And, uh, we actually experienced that. And uh, then the communists. And you know, back, you, today you don't think about communists uh, being a part of uh, the inquiry then, but. Uh, but uh, the University of Chicago, in particular, was a real bed of communists, and it was bad, you know, <laughs> or so many, or a lot of people thought so. And uh, I remember one time our uh, Boy Scout troop, we used to meet in the basement of the Unitarian Church, and after the meeting, uh, we went up and there was something going on up in the church itself. And we, we went in and sat down. It was a communist cell meeting. <laughs> and the, uh, the contrast from the Boy Scout troop <laughs> going to a communist meeting. And the, uh, they had just begun. And one person challenged, well, uh, the head speaker was up there where the minister usually was, and uh, whether that's proper or not, and, and uh, it, uh, mumbled a while, of course it's where he wants to be. So, uh, And uh, then uh, somebody commented about the kids, and uh, not someone else said, well, that's good, these kids need, <laughs> need to get it too. Well, finally, we, out of boredom, we, we left. <laughs> out of boredom. Yeah, right, right. Well, let me go back, though, and ask you uh, about the gangster thing. I mean, yes, what, right. what did it feel like? How much did people Well, uh, every day, it could, uh, uh, there were uh, some of the students were uh, uh, children of wealthy people, and they were targets for kidnapping. So uh, probably... Oh, eight or ten arrived every morning with their bodyguards in men uh, in suit and tie would just sit in the front of the school until the time to go, and then their uh, chauffeur-driven cars would pick them up, and so uh, 
every day we saw the, the felt the threat of that, and uh, one thing that really happened was my mother was in a, a, on a, com a commuter train from the south side, ran up. Uh, into the downtown, and she was walking through the tunnel under Michigan Avenue, where the uh, and it was a time when there were not many people coming. These big, uh, brightly lighted tunnels, and the man next to her, maybe ten feet away. Uh, some people jumped up and machine gunned him down, right, right there. And uh, of course, that was a uh, disturbing experience. <laughs> but it turned out uh, in the papers the next day that it, he was the star crime reporter for the Chicago Tribune. And then a few days later, it turned out he had gang connections and it was uh, the attack on him was by another gang a, a, a mob of gangsters so so you but, lived this this era yeah right yeah right what was it uh, do you remember what it was like when Elliot Ness came in and broke it all up was this, uh, and, and prosecuted the mobsters how did that was that a big deal or not yeah right it was in the papers all the time yes right. But uh, I, I don't remember when it stopped later on uh, when uh, I was, I think I was in college, or, or no, maybe, maybe, I was still in high school. Uh, my mother and father had gone out to dinner and uh, parked our a big uh, seven-passenger limousine outside the Swedish club on the north side and it came out and the car was gone. Well, later it turned out the car had been stolen by John Dillinger. <laughs> really? And he uh, drove that car uh, with his gang, robbing banks through, this was the height of his career, through Indiana and Illinois, and when he came back to Chicago, the FBI evidently had him staked out. He was living right on the near north side and was uh, coming out of a movie theater when he was shot down by J. Edgar Hoover. And what seems to me is that they knew enough of time for to get J. Edgar Hoover to come from Washington, and actually, just the guy walked out of the movie theater, uh, just shot him dead. <laughs> there was no trial or anything. The director, the director. But you know that was fairly uh, no uh, comment about the whether that was proper or not. Yeah. That's the famous lady in red. Yeah, story. right, that, yeah, right. Wow. Well, that, after that, we got the, the car back and found out that this, what, the whole time it was missing, it had been used by Dillinger. <laughs> yeah, right. But it, it came back into use in the family? Yeah, we used it for about another year. <laughs> <laughs> That's a wonderful story. Yeah, right. Um, let me come back on uh, other in interests growing up. What uh, you said, scouts. Anything else that you said? Oh yeah, I like to do that. Well, I did a lot of things. You know, I built my first boat when I was 11 years old, and uh, kept building boats. Uh, in fact, one of them's over in the barn over <laughs> here, and uh, I went on to own. Uh, big sailboats. I owned a 55-foot schooner and then an 80-foot uh, sailing catch that 
we kept in California. But so, so boats very early on, sailing in Lake Michigan, I assume. Yes, right, that's right, yeah. Now, with your, uh, how old were you when you were allowed to go out by yourself? Well, I uh, don't know if I was allowed to, but <laughs> I was, was going out. And, uh, in fact, speaking of not being allowed to, I first uh, flew in an airplane. My, my family never knew about it, but uh, one of my friends had written a, read a book about how to fly then learned it well enough that he went out to Midway Airport and took lessons. And uh, on one occasion, uh, I flew with him and, and the instructor. And years later, my, up in the Canadian Rockies, my father uh, chartered a little seaplane uh, to fly my brother and mother around in the, the sightseeing. And the, the big celebration was that he, my brother had, had flown for the first time. And I, I was just sitting there. I, I probably had <laughs> flown three or four years before that. <laughs> you weren't going to give it away. But it's, uh, so. As far as permission, uh, there, I did a lot of things my family didn't know about, but uh, uh, nothing uh, I'm ashamed of, it, so I well, kind of enjoyed it. I'm sure not, yes. Uh, right. uh, uh, it sounds like your family traveled a lot. Was that part of the... Uh... Yes, right. Uh, well, we uh, spent summers in uh, on the Michigan shore and took canoe trips, the three boys and my father, uh, up in uh, Quetico National Park, uh, like 10 days with two canoes and a guide and so forth, two guides, so. And uh, then after we uh, stopped doing that, we went uh, to Wyoming for summers and my father through a business uh, had a friend who owned a big uh, logging and timber operation in Wyoming and uh, we would go for uh, the summer and at the end of the logging camp uh, they had three log cabins that were built for uh, uh, top uh, staff and one for guests that we stayed in each summer and rode horseback every day and, and sometimes went out overnight with our just a blanket and with just a bare minimum amount of food and would go great distances uh, up in the Wind River Mountains. Right? Is that when the American West got into your blood, so to speak? Uh, I think so, yes, right. You growing up, was a, it sounds like it was a happy one. Yes, it was, right. Who was the disciplinarian, your mom or your dad? Uh, mainly my dad, yeah, right. He was a man who uh, just uh, came from uh, very minimal accomplishment. His parents were uh, in Sweden, both worked uh, for a, fa a wealthy family and they, my grandmother was a housemaid in, this, in their big uh, house on this uh, very large farm and my uh, grandfather worked in the uh, uh, blacksmith shop and uh, so that that was the background that my father came from. But I, I can see that story of uh, it taking the sons out uh, for canoeing and out to Wyoming. So, so there must have been um, quite strong connections and quite a good feeling within your family. Then I, uh, I don't see yeah, the, the yeah, austere, yeah, distant yeah, father I, in this. No. Yeah, we always had. Uh, 
dinner together, and family, and um, in Chicago we had a live-in maid who cooked. So, uh, but in Wyoming we uh, shared everything as a family. A, lot um, of a few words about your your mother. What was she like? Uh, well, she was. Uh, it was a time when women ran the family, the household, and uh, she had uh, other uh, friends in the neighborhood. Where um, some were faculty wives and so forth, but uh, uh, she uh, did not have a career other than uh, raising four children. So you're back and you graduate from the uh, uh, laboratory school with this group of kids you've been in first grade with basically all the way right. through and yes. you get out and then you're faced with, well, what do I do next? What did you do? Well, I went uh, to uh, Purdue University as an engineering, mechanical engineering student. And uh, really that's... Uh, when I left Chicago and really only saw family on holidays or vacations. And uh, Purdue was an <clears throat> interesting, uh, wonderful time. Again, I was not a very good student, but had other interests. And uh, one was, uh, I don't know, there, there was a craft shop in the uh, student union building, and um, I'd gone in there and met the uh, guy who was running it, and he was a, uh, I had a MFA degree from um, John Heron Institute in Indianapolis, and of course, uh, not being able to get employment of an artist was just mm -hmm. running this craft shop and he got me interested in p painting so I used to uh, just after uh, school go down to the craft shop and uh, do paintings and, uh, in fact there's one of those paintings hanging in the kitchen here uh, we'll have a shot of that yeah, maybe right. it sounds a uh, uh, oh. Are, are you a solitary person at this time? Uh, I no, that. no. I was uh, living in uh, the uh, men's dormitories and, you know, uh, had meals and everything with a group. They had a private room, but mm -hmm. uh, so had a, many friends. So uh, that was a good experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you're down um, developing a love of painting, right. and uh, you occasionally cracked a book, but uh, yes. what, what else did you do? Well, uh, uh, we rode bicycles out into the country, we just went, but toured it. Uh, no one had a private car then, and, you know, we would go off for uh, uh, 50 miles on a, some you know, tour and back. These, or old bicycles with coaster brakes and uh, big tires and what uh, that was uh, a wonderful way to see the country and we used to just spend a lot of time outside around the campus the uh, agricultural uh, department uh, the campus there was very big. Anything looking back on your youth, any stories that we have not covered in this sit-down? Well, I told you about the communists. Yeah. Uh, but uh, and I, one thing about that is uh, we experienced that right in our school because uh, a lot of the uh, uh, laboratory school faculty were... Uh, people from the university, especially mm -hmm. ones that had children, would teach one or two classes uh, in the high school there. And uh, one day, well, we went to school, and Mr. Hill, our uh, history teacher, was in jail. <laughs> uh, 
and uh, he was in jail as a communist. And, you know, thinking back, the due process and everything didn't exist then, you mm. know. They just hauled people off to jail. And Mr. Hill was in uh, the jail for two days and then back in school. His son Jimmy was in my class, so we were interested mm. in that. But uh, there were several uh, in the uh, faculty that were uh, uh, jailed and so forth. Hyde Park became, of course, one of the uh, think tank areas for the development of the uh, atomic weapons. Yeah, so right. Yeah. Well, that, in high school, I was in the swimming team, and we used to practice in the university pool, which was right across the street from Stag Field, and it was under the bleachers there that the atomic uh, research was going on, and where they uh, first uh, uh, caused a, a nuclear uh, experiment to succeed on a very small scale. Did people really know that there were scientists going in no, and out of the football no, stadium? Didn't know thing? that at all. No, really? no right. <laughs> <laughs> were you dating a lot? No, no, no. I, I met my first wife uh, my last year working in the craft shop. And uh, she was three years, she was a freshman when I was a senior. And uh, when I graduated, I went into the Navy. I was commissioned as an officer. Uh, and an engineering officer in particular. So, so, so let's date the year. I can't do the math in my head. So you graduated in what year? 1942, yeah, right. So this is, uh, the, the war is really raging. Yeah, right, right, yeah, right. Do you have any qualms about uh, being commissioned and going in? No, well, I was qualms about how I was commissioned because I had no training at all to go and buy a uniform, put it on, and you're a Navy officer, get on a train to go to uh, 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 Norfolk, uh, Virginia, my first assignment, and uh, uh, that, uh, there was a brief interlude, I'm sorry. Uh, first, we went to Cornell University, okay. where uh, we, uh, the whole group I was assigned with were graduate engineers, and uh, we had been assigned to a beginning engineering program by the Navy uh, to uh, get... Uh, uh, some engineering background, but every, every one of us uh, had an engineering degree, so that was uh, about six weeks of just relaxing, and every, the whole class would make a hundred every time. So, <laughs> but uh, that was a, a nice summer, and from there I went to. Uh, <clears throat> Norfolk, Virginia, and transferred up onto a uh, uh, minesweeper, um, and we uh, swept mines in uh, the channels in New York, and uh, they uh, uh, wanted to go into Norfolk, the big naval base. Did you there. find any mines? Uh, we. Uh, exploded uh, maybe one or two, and they were these magnetic mines that uh, you would uh, sweep a big electric cable up and uh, with uh, cop big copper uh, anodes hanging off of it to uh, make a uh, magnetic field to uh, uh, in other words, mimic a ship passing over. 
and the minesweeper was all wood construction and uh, uh, could pass over safely. So uh, we did uh, uh, in the Norfolk Channel uh, sweep some mines, yes. How long were you on that ship? Uh, less than a year. Then I was transferred to a, a ship that was a combination mine sweeper and escort vessel, and uh, were sent uh, to uh, the Caribbean, and we never did. It never functioned as a mine sweeper the whole time. We were escorting convoys and. The uh, <clears throat> convoy routes were in segments, and our segment was from Guantanamo to Trinidad. And uh, there's because of the North Atlantic U-boats uh, danger, a lot of the uh, most of the ships were bound for the uh, United Kingdom, mm -hmm. but uh, had to go to the south to uh, avoid the biggest uh, uh, submarine, uh, German submarine threat. Mm. And uh, we um, <clears throat> lost uh, only one ship uh, in a convoy that, that was uh, the convoys were uh, just amazing experiences. Uh, because? Because uh, we'd be the escort vessels, and usually uh, the escort uh, head was be in the center, and, and uh, one on either out, out on the sides or two out on the sides. And the, then the uh, Ships may be uh, over six wide or uh, eight wide, uh, following behind, you know, mm. like 50 at a time. But, and You uh, can still see it in your mind, I think. Yeah, and um, we uh, would pick up a, a convoy at uh, Guantanamo or sometimes uh, uh, in the uh, uh, Dutch uh, uh, harbors, uh, uh, Aruba and Curaçao, which was, those were uh, safe staging areas, and uh, pick up a convoy, take it to uh, Trinidad, be met by the ones coming from the, uh, across the Atlantic, and uh, it would all just be uh, uh, very beautifully arranged when mm. the, the new escort would take up and the old one would drop off. Well, what, what did you do all day on a boat? I mean, you're, you're on a ship with X number of people. I often wondered. Well, it's, uh, you know, it's running 24 hours a day, and uh, I was also a watch officer, and uh, it'd be uh, like... Uh, um, four hours or six hours on, and then uh, eight hours off. Depends on uh, the state of readiness you were on. The, the uh, uh, least uh, where you know, felt the safest would be you were only on. Uh, a watch would change every four hours, and you'd have six hours off, but that constantly rotated. All right. So uh, you're on the second ship, and you went on to serve on a third? Yes. Uh, the, um, I was uh, home on leave and uh, assigned to uh, a ship that was uh, being commissioned in Los Angeles, uh, in uh, uh, New Orleans and uh, spent uh, about a month there before we uh, sailed to the Pacific. And 
uh, sailed right out to Pearl Harbor. And this ship was a very large supply ship. And uh, we would uh, pick up supplies in Pearl Harbor and then go out to the uh, staging areas for the, where they were um, massing these uh, invasion fleets for Japan. And in the lagoons, uh, uh, in those, uh, that part of the uh, eastern Pacific, you know, there would be at any one time hundreds of ships at anchor waiting, uh, uh, being built up for the invasion. And we would uh, be there available as a uh, supply source for this whole great number of ships, and after we unloaded, we would go back to Pearl Harbor again. So w were you there uh, in the Pacific for the end of the war then? I was, we were, our last uh, one was in the Philippines, in Lady Gulf, and uh, we uh, were there just, uh, uh, as things were winding down, they'd already dropped, uh, I think, the, when we first arrived in the Philippines, the first uh, bomb on Japan. When the bomb was dropped, the, the reasoning was that it would save a lot of lives uh, in invading the Japanese islands. How, how, how did the people on the ships feel um, about the atomic bombs and all of that? Well, of course, everyone uh, felt very good about that. You know, I think the whole uh, world did. Uh, that uh, there was no uh, good solution to that war other than just uh, so many people were going to die and keep on if it hadn't happened. That uh, that was the best thing that could have happened. And, then after that, uh, on the, the other point system, and I, my seniority was high enough so that uh, uh, I left my last ship in uh, Lady Gulf. Uh, and came back. Came Put away back. the uniform. You're a civilian again. Then yeah. what happens? Well, uh, went to Chicago. And, uh, my wife was down in... Uh, uh, Cuba, and her father ran the, uh, he was an old-time railroad person who had built uh, railroads in uh, uh, South and Central America, and in his uh, later years was running the Cuban National Railway. And, uh, I went down there, and she'd been staying with her father, and uh, we spent maybe ten days there, and then came back to Chicago, packed up my belongings, sent them parcel post, and came to New Mexico on a train. That's when the Santa Fe train ran all the way to Roswell, and. Really? The super came, chief the... came here, and I've been here ever since. <laughs> <laughs> well, now, did, did did you throw a dart at the map of the United States, or how did you decide on New Mexico? No, uh, my uh, brother Bob had uh, uh, spent a couple of summers in, when he was in college working in the Texas oil fields, and. I had really gotten to figure out that was what he wanted to do. And uh, my father had a friend who owned refineries in Oklahoma and uh, somehow came up with the idea that this little refinery in Artesia, New Mexico, uh, was for sale. and. Uh, uh, my father uh, was able to get enough money together and loan to us that we bought the refinery, 
Bob stayed on and ran it. Um, and that was, I think, uh, about the time of uh, Pearl Harbor is when he first came to mm -hmm. New Mexico and became the president of a refinery. <laughs> that was his first experience. But uh, he stayed on, ran the refinery, and uh, managed to, uh, during the war, upgrade it so uh, they could make uh, uh, 91 octane a aviation gasoline which was quite an accomplishment because uh, they just made uh, motor fuel and tractor fuel and diesel fuel up until then. Did you know you were going, did you have a burning desire to go into oil and gas? What, or did you see that in your future? Next? My, when I was in the Navy, my father used to write and tell me a lot about things like that, but really I hardly read his letters, but I was no more interested. Well, you know, in, when you're in the Navy and the services, it's a total experience, and uh, that that was what uh, I was doing. And uh, that, uh, the Navy was, life was an uh, amazing experience because this huge American Navy was just run by civilians, people like me, that officers, that just, uh, and uh, it turned out that we did a hell of a fine job, and it was, it was just constantly amazing to, uh, that uh, really in, in such a short a time, we, uh, country, uh, got that kind of expertise meant to have its huge effective military. Uh, had a great impact on your life then, because you had a lot of responsibility being an yeah, officer. Yeah, right, yeah, right. And good discipline. Don Anderson, thank you very much for sitting down with us. Let's okay, do it again. well, thank you, Hugh. Right.